Good afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting to order for the affordable housing program. Um, can we take the roll, please? Thank you. President Lewis Jordan? Here. Secretary Olivia Diaz? Here. Treasurer Fred Heron? Present. Director Craig? Present. Director Disman? Here. Director Black? Here. Director McCurdy? Present. Director Seegerbloom? Here. Director Shaw? And Director Turner? A quorum is present, and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there an approval for the agenda? I'll move to approve the agenda. Second. It's been approved by uh, Director Diaz and seconded by Director Craig. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Okay. Is there any public comment? Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to the matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, come to the podium and give your name for the record. The amount of discussion as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Public comment that is repetitive, slanderous, uh, offensive, and inflammatory uh, amounts to personal attacks or interferes with the right of other speakers is not allowed. Any person who acts in violation of these rules will be excused for the remainder of the meeting. Would anyone like to make public comment? Hearing none, our next item is the approval of the state, the approval to grant state Nevada, the state of Nevada Department of Transportation a right of way of easement at Auto, uh, Auto Meriden Desert Vila, Mirada Desert Vila. Frank, you want to come up and speak to that? Good afternoon. I'm Frank Stafford, Director of Development and Modernization. Uh, the background on this item is the State of Nevada, Nevada, State of Nevada Department of Transportation is seeking to undergo a highway expansion project located at the corner of 95 Freeway and the Charleston Boulevard which will run along the southerly portion of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority, Autumn Merida Desert Villas property uh, at 8 p.m. 140-31-402-001, and that's located at 50 North Honolulu Street. In an effort to alleviate congestion and improve traffic flow, NDOT re wishes to complete the necessary construction on Charles Boulevard uh, to accommodate the expansion of the 515 freeway. In an effort to be more transparent to expedite this request, the SNR and HA seeks to grant NDOT a right-of-way easement at this location. The action that we're requesting is to authorize the president to enter into an agreement with the state of Nevada Department of Highway Transportation uh, and sign all documents necessary to grant a right-of-way easement at the Automo Moretta Desert Villas property. Are there any questions? I do have a question, Mr. Stafford. Have they told us how much of our property they need for this easement and our right of way. So how much are we talking about? Okay, basically what the uh, the right of way is gonna consist of is currently uh, the the southerly portion of uh, Charleston Boulevard on the property. There is a curb cut and a turn in that used to enter into the, the old property. So the right of way is gonna basically take that sidewalk portion, it's gonna close that sidewalk completely off and then on Honolulu, they're gonna do a, a curb cut in the sidewalk of the Honolulu side for an entrance. But we won't be able to do anything along the, uh, the sidewalk portion along Charleston. So it's basically just to the back of the curb. Yes, yes. Director Craig. I have a question. Um, how feasible would it be? I, people can talk, but I can see it. Would it be feasible if we could at least see what it would look like if it's cut off? Am I asking for too much to maybe have a diagram or something like that? I'm not from here, so you understand my dilemma? Right. You're talking about mm -hmm. chop, I'm just cutting this off and cutting that off. And if I could see it, or was I asking well, for too much? They're, they're, not, they're actually not cutting anything off. It's, you have the off-ramp where you pull off the uh, 
I-515, and you would normally make a right turn down Charleston Boulevard. Our property is situated directly at that off-ramp. So the way the off-ramp runs, it runs parallel to the back of our property. You make that right turn, and there is an entrance that goes into that property. So if any cars or anything was coming off, that's like a dangerous, would be a dangerous uh, area to be backing out anyway. It's a vacant lot that's there now. There's, there's no buildings. Everything is vacant. So, Frank, maybe a, a question I would have that we can give clarification on. What, if any, impact does this have on the residents or, or people in general? Uh, you know, as I indicated, that corner is vacant. The Honolulu okay. property sets back probably, I'd say maybe uh, six to 900 feet. So, so that we left that property intentionally vacant. So if we wanted to develop it at a later time, you could put like, say, a service station, a Starbucks, some type of commercial building. So that property sets vacant. There's absolutely no impact at all to the okay. residents. Thank you. Any other commissioner for Curdy? Yes. So, so um, are we going to, is the housing authority going to be compensated for this? Or, you know, it's, I, I know uh, in the past when there were certain projects done by NDOT, um, the, the property owners were compensated when they did expansion, for example, with the, along the I-15 mm -hmm. corridor to the west. Uh, yes, yes, we will. What NDOT is, re is uh, requesting in addition to the right of way, they're asking for a 364-day easement on that site. And then granting that, that easement portion, there's a fee of $4,660 that will be compensated for that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Yes? I have uh, one more. Today. Okay. So if it's going to be cut off, you're saying there's property. So they're going to get all of the property that's there? Am I understanding it? Because this one, I have no, to see it. They're no, getting. No, that's, that's not correct. They're, they're not going to, they won't attain any of the property. It's the sidewalk oh, portion. The sidewalk. Okay. Yeah, it's just a portion of the sidewalk. They're, they're having a right away on that. And what that does is that we can't come back and open the sidewalk back up or, you know, put anything that's going to block that area. I mean, it's just the sidewalk portion. You know, we can't put any signs up, anything that's going to, you know, reduce uh, traffic uh, flow or sight or what have you. Okay. I yeah, that. the property will not be impacted. Thank you. If I may have another question, yes. Mr. Please. President. So um, in our analysis of granting this easement to the Nevada Department of Transportation, does it alter or change the quality of life for our residents that live there? Or as you stated before, it's pretty much a vacant side of the property that doesn't have very mm. much use. I just want to be cognizant of potential impacts of granting the easement for the yeah. flow of the community versus now the flow of the freeway that's being expanded? No, at, at this particular point, the residents that live at the property, they have no access to that site. The, the street that turns into the Otto Marita property is, like I said, it's probably a good 900 feet or so back. Just, just take an example. Where you're sitting at, that's Charleston Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Where I'm at, this is the Otto property. The vacant lot is in between, so the residents would come along the side and turn into the property that way. Okay. So I it doesn't just, impact them at all. I, I think that's important to get on the record. Thank you. All right. Director Craig? I just have one more question. No, please. Say, so my question need. is, how feasible from this day forward to on that whenever you come to us and you talk about some change, I'm just thinking yeah. some changes that are going to be done, that you maybe present us something that we can see, uh, maybe a video, you understand what I'm saying? A video or maybe even a drawing or something mm -hmm. that would be easier so that some of these questions mm -hmm. would be eased. That would uh, be very feasible. That's, that's not a problem. And yeah. actually, I do have a, a diagram that I could have placed in the back up on that. But we have, we have a diagram of the site. And, and, and I'd be happy to share that with you later. This is in the packet, I think, if I'm not mistaken. It's yeah. in the regular board meeting packet. Pardon? It's in the regular board meeting yes, packet. Yes, it, it's, it's in the regular board meeting packet. Yes, it is, sir. But the point, the point is well taken. And we can make sure the next time we make a such presentation, we can highlight or illustrate the, uh, the diagram. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Is there a motion? A move to approve as presented. Okay. It's been a move. Second. Second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, Aye. any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. It's been moved and approved. Thank you, Frank. Um, the next item is citizen participation. 
Items raised under this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated upon by the Board of Directors of the Affordable Housing Program until notice pro uh, provisions of the open meeting law have been compli complied with. If you wish to speak on the matter on, on off, if you wish to speak to the matters on or off the agenda, please step up to the podium and clearly state your name and address. In consideration of others, avoid repetition and limit your comments to no more than three minutes to ensure all persons have equal opportunity to speak. Each subject matter will be limited to 12, um, 12 minutes. As a courtesy, we would also ask that, um, that we not have people speak or um, speaking to, to seated and not interrupt the um, speaker or the directors. Okay, seeing none, um, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. I would now like to call to Mr. order. Mr. Jordan, we have to do a motion. Pardon? We have to do the motion. We need a move to close the meeting out. Okay, I have a motion to close the meeting. I'll move to close okay. the meeting of the Affordable Housing Program, Inc. Thank you, Jessica. Second. second. Been moved and second to close the meeting. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, I have it. Thank you. Okay, I'd now like to call to order the, um, the Honolulu Street Family Apartments uh, LLC meeting. Um, Madam Clerk, will you take the roll call, please? President Jordan? Here. Secretary Diaz? Here. Treasurer Heron? Present. Director Craig? Present. Director Disman? Mm -hmm. Director Black? Director McCurdy, Present. Director Siegerblum, Here. Director Shaw, and Director Turner. A quorum is present, and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there an approval of the agenda? A motion for the approval? It's been motioned by Director McCurdy and seconded by uh, Director Heron. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. The next item on the agenda is public comment. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, come to the podium and give your name for the record, the amount of discussion, as well as the amount of time any speaker is allowed may be limited. Public comment that is repetitious, slanderous, offensive, and inflammatory amounts to personal attacks or interference with the rights of other speakers is not allowed. Any person who acts in violation of these rules will be excused for the remainder of the meeting. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, we'll go on to item number four, the approval of the grant to grant the state of Nevada Department of Transportation a right-of-way easement at Otto and Mirada Desert Villas. Again, Mr. Frank Stafford. Mr. President, will, I move to approve this item. Okay, it's been moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. I have it. Um, the next item on the agenda is, is uh, citizen participation. Is there any citizen participation for this item? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? There's Second. Then, okay. Motion by... Director McCurdy, second by Director Diaz. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, meeting adjourned. I'd like to now call to order the uh, Otto Meridia Villa LLC meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk, we take the uh, roll. President Jordan? Here. Secretary Diaz? Here. Treasurer Heron? Present. Director Craig? Present. Director Disman? Here. Director Black. Here. Director McCurdy. Here. Director Siegerblum. Here. Director Shaw. And Director Turner. Okay. Is there an approval of the agenda? I move to approve my third note. Second motion. Okay. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, um, 
The next item, approval to grant the State of Nevada Department of Transportation the right-of-way easement at Auto Mirada Desert Villa. President, I move to approve this item as well. There's a, uh, um, there's a move to approve the item. Is there a second? I'll second. Moved and second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. The, uh, motion carries. Is there any citizen participation on this item? Is there a recommendation to uh, adjourn the meeting? Yes, I'll move to adjourn the meeting, Mr. It's President. It's been moved and second to adjourn the um, Auto Meridia Villa meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. All right, we're going to continue on with our regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority this Thursday, November 17th, 2022. And if everyone will please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for joining us today. And Madam Chair, uh, Madam Secretary, if you could please take the roll. Thank you. Chairperson Diaz? Present. Vice Chairperson McCurdy? Present. Commissioner Black? Here. Commissioner Craig? Present. Commissioner Disman? Here. Commissioner Seegerbloom? Here. Commissioner Shaw? And Commissioner Turner? A quorum is present, and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. All right, we're gonna go ahead and start the meeting with public comment. If there's anyone wishing to come to the podium at this time, they need to make sure that their comments are strictly on things that are noted in our agenda and um, that they are for discussion and possible action. So if you wish to be heard, come to the speaker's podium, clearly state your name and address and spell your last name for the record. Is there anyone wishing to offer public comment? Seeing none, we're going to close that first period of public comment and we're going to strike agenda item number three. We don't have minutes that have been vetted for approval, so we're going to postpone that to the next meeting. We're going to move on to agenda item number four, approval of the agenda with the inclusion of or any emergency items and deletion of items. So aside from striking the minutes, is, are there any other considerations we need to make to the agenda? Madam Chair, there are none. Okay. Seeing none, I have a first from Commissioner McCurdy. Second. And motion. a second from Commissioner Craig. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to our consent agenda item, number five, approval of request to write off outstanding tenant accounts, receivable vacated accounts for the period ending September 30th, 2022. And I'll entertain a motion. I have a first from Commissioner McCurdy. Second and a second from Commissioner Craig to approve the consent agenda items. Any questions or discussion on this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. That concludes our consent agenda. We'll move on to our um, section three, agenda item six, acknowledgement of our departed. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Since our last gathering we've lost a few of our residents and i'll um read the list and then ask for a moment of silence uh, benny anderson bonnie brassfield madeline cates calvin harris freddie jackson david marsh reggie morgan alfred thomas jr bernard whitmore and lawrence rice Thank you for keeping these individuals in your thoughts and prayers and their families. All right, thank you, Mr. Jordan. We'll move on to section number four. All of these items will be taken separately um, for discussion and possible action. So the first one is under development and modernization, we have agenda item seven, a request to approve to grant an easement for right of way purposes to the state of Nevada Department of Transportation at the Auto Medida Desert Villas property. 
And just, I think, Mr. Stafford, if you can just come and articulate again, just for the record to be crystal clear as to why we're about to move this. Okay, Frank Stafford, Director of Development Modernization. Uh, background is, back in 2016, members of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority met with the representatives from the State of Nevada Department of Transportation and uh, to discuss sidewalk alterations needed for the improvements plan for the I-515 and Charleston Boulevard interchange. During that meeting, we also mentioned, they also mentioned plans and development for additional improvements to the 515 between Spaghetti Bowl and Charleston, and these plans are now coming to fruition. The plan improvements include the widening of the 515 off ramp at Charleston Boulevard, which would impact the SNRHA Auto Merida Desabella's property located at 50 North Honolulu Street. Therefore, NDOT is seeking to enter into an agreement with the SNRHA to grant an easement for a right of way at the southern portion of Auto Merida Desabella's. In the past, the board has authorized the SNRH to grant easement at other properties for similar purpose without issue. Action that's being requested is authorize the executive director to enter into an agreement with NDOT and execute any and all documents necessary to grant an easement for a right of way at Auto Merida. And I just wanted to note that the backup for this item was actually behind the SNRHA and you'll see all the diagrams that reflect that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Stafford. It does articulate all of the dimensions by feet and inches right. to the T there, so right. appreciate that. Are there any questions for Mr. Stafford at this time? If not, I'm willing to entertain a motion. There are no further questions of approval. I have a first from Commissioner McCurdy. Second. A second from Commissioner Craig. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. We'll move on to procurement. Agenda item number eight, a request for approval of contract increase for Heritage Consulting B plus R LLC. And I'll handle this one, uh, Madam Chair. So we brought in the um, Heritage Consulting firm to assist us in our HR function in both recruiting and to do uh, investigations. They came in, they started the work. Um, there were issues that arose in this process that required additional um, attention. And so under the terms of the contract, we were able to make an initial in, um, increase in the contract as it related to the, um, the recruitment piece. We're now coming to you now to say we need to add additional dollars to the contract to satisfy some of the things that the vendor is doing as it relates to some investigations that we're doing. And that's the, the purpose of coming to you. We'll exceed the threshold that the executive director has, which is $150,000. Are there any questions at all? Any questions? I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, you said things the vendors, so what are they doing I don't need to know all of it, but what okay. are they doing differently that would make us increase it? Give me so, a, I need to give me a picture. Just sure. So for example, they're helping us look at the job postings. They're helping us look at where we're advertising. We're, we're um, getting more into the virtual world of advertising. Um, job descriptions or job postings as we see them. Um, they're actually setting a template for us to be much more efficient and much better as we move forward. On the investigation side, they're assisting HR, and these are internal investigations we're talking about, um, coming from employees around issues that they're saying that they're facing in the organization. And sometimes these investigations are so sensitive that it makes better sense to have a, a third party look at them versus have the individual individuals either, either in HR and or the departments look at them. So at the end of the day, we'll get you know, um, a revised job postings. We'll get a, a, a more up-to-date process in our recruitment efforts than we have currently. They were brought in initially to just take a look at where we are. And as they reported out to us, we found that there was much more work any further questions? Can I have one more before you make that motion? I just have a question about, I know that they're improving our efficiencies in our human resources department. 
and um, by extending and um, allowing them to do further work with us through this, uh, having the board support, obviously, uh, until when do we expect them to continue to work with We're, this, we're looking, with I want to say 90 days or so. Okay, so yeah. 90 more days of work this yes. would extend? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. all right, thank you so much. All right, so I'll take, I have, oh, another. Ex I just wrote the existing pending investigations. And so you want to close them out. So what would make this organization any better, even though they may be objective on the outside? What have they given proven to you that they're able to get in with the information and look at the existing pending investigations and be more thorough and less biased? Not saying they're biased, but humanity, we're human. So what I'm, I'm not understanding the question. Uh, what would make them better at investigating versus what you've had? Why do you, why is it something saying that your pending investigations have not been competent? Um, I don't know if I would use the term competent, okay. but I would say that those, those um, pending investigations have been often. We, we get a lot of investigations. Um, my, during my executive director report, we'll talk about an overall scan of the organization I've done. And um, so we have an opportunity to improve and, 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 and enhance our culture so that employees can feel that if they use the handbook process, those items that they bring forward will be addressed and they'll be addressed fairly and equitably. I can't necessarily say that that's always the case here. And oftentimes when employees will come in and say, I have an issue with my manager or I have an issue with a department, I, I think to both protect the, the employee and the organization, it's best practice to go outside and have someone look at that issue versus have it done internally. So in other words, you're saying, I, my mind is saying, in other words, that has occurred because you have not had an outside person come in. There's that sort of unique situation where it's not so If I can kind of also shed some light sitting on the city side of things and sometimes we have personnel issues where it doesn't warrant our own entity launching the investigation between the organization and the employee. Therefore, in order to not compromise that investigation, we have to outsource it, get a third party in so that they don't say we skewed the results of the investigation towards the org or towards the employee. So that's why to protect ourselves, we need to make sure that we contract it out, if that makes sense. Good answer. All right, any further comments or questions? If not, I'm willing to entertain a motion. I have a first from Commissioner McCurdy. Second. A second from Commissioner Disman. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. He had his finger up, Commissioner Craig. He oh, I, 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 the voice didn't sound like <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you knew his finger was up, so I took it as the second. All right. We're going to go ahead and move on to business items in Section 5, Agenda Item 9, receive reports from the Executive Director on administrative and operational activities of the agency. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a few things I just wanted to mention, but I wanted to yield the majority of my time for presentations this afternoon. Um, first of all, I wanted to introduce Alicia Jones. Alicia Jones is over in the corner. Stand up, if you will. Alicia is our new uh, HCV Director. Uh, she comes to us Welcome, with Ms. Jones. Uh, quite a bit of experience. Bienvenidos. And uh, so we want to welcome her. And also wanted to acknowledge both um, Anita Keys and Angela Yenchek. I'll have them stand up. Uh, as you know, for the last 11 months or so, Anita has, has um, served as our acting director of HCV and Angela, her deputy director. And so. Um, we're really, really pleased to have uh, Alicia with us, but at the same time, I would be remiss to not publicly thank uh, Anita and Angela for their hard work over these last, um, last 11 months. So thank you. <laughs> Continuing, I wanted to um, just acknowledge some of the work that uh, Commissioner Desmond has been working with staff on as it relates to us um, building a, a pre-apprenticeship program. You know, as we talk about, you know, our priorities, you know, I, I often talk about customer service, getting more vouchers, 
or more housing opportunities, and last but certainly not least, creating opportunities for our, the residents who live in public housing, Section 8 and, and all of our programs. And so um, Commissioner Desmond and I and staff have been working to craft a process that, um, that can you know, bring that back to fruition. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, former executive director uh, Tom Golson. Tom was the ED here at the Housing Authority a while back, and I asked Tom to stand. Yeah, and um, Tom, Tom is here. Um, Tom started in a pre-apprenticeship program um, as when he was here as a deputy and then executive director, and you know, making sure that that we're taking advantage of all the resources possible. We actually brought Tom in to support. Um, Commissioner Desmond and his vision as well as ours in an effort to um, see how we can breathe life back into this program. So I wanted to uh, make those acknowledgments. Also, um, if the commissioners recall, about six months ago, you approved a contract for the Bronner Group to come in and do a uh, organizational scan, if you will, uh, as I was new and wanting to make sure that as we move forward, you know, you had as much information and I as well on how we go from good to great. And so I wanted to invite Gila Bronner from the um, Bronner Group up to just give a short presentation on, uh, on what they've uh, identified in their organizational scan and some proposed next steps. So, Gila, I have a question. Welcome, Ms. Bronner. <clears throat> Thank you, I'm double-fisted here. Uh, commissioners, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, what I'd like to do is just give you an overview of the work that we have conducted over the past six months. We were engaged and began our project in May, just about six months ago. And we were able, the objective of which was indeed to conduct an enterprise-wide assessment of the current organizational and operational framework of the authority to optimize performance. We looked at eight key operational areas and we looked at processes, capabilities, resources, and structure. Our approach covered three different phases, three distinct phases of work, discovery, analysis, and reporting. We interviewed over 20 individuals, some multiple times, looked and uh, conducted a comprehensive documentation review. We also performed a series of analyses looking at uh, financial, historical, and current data, as well as performance information. We looked at alternative revenue sourcing. And what we talk about there in revenue sourcing is looking at the source of funding, both federal and non-federal, and where there might be opportunities to expand. We did indeed look at organizational and operational framework, as well as risk management framework for the organization. Coming out of that, we, we prepared a report that is being finalized right now to be shared. Our work was conducted within what we call a SWOT framework, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We looked at four main swim lanes, both internal and external, two of which focused on internal operations and two of which were external facing. We developed and arrived at 97 insights, and we like to call them insights because they aren't necessarily findings. They're observations, some of them are what we would consider to be insights in, into alternative ways to perhaps look and operate. The two internal facing areas were staffing, culture, and training, as well as internal processes and structure, looking at ways to improve that. Externally, we focused on client relationships and the whole in way, the entire way that the authority engages with its clients with its residents, as well as external relationships, whether that's overlapping units of government, uh, oversight bodies, as well as potential and current funders. We have six key takeaways from our work 
that are embodied in a series of the recommendations that will be included in the report. We view these as opportunity areas. One, addressing the way that management current operates, which presently is in a highly siloed manner. Um, I would suggest having the two distinct physical locations doesn't help and to contribute necessarily positively in that regard. The current organizational design, we looked at that, we looked at spans of control and how the various business units integrated and engaged with one another. Our conclusion was that the current structure does not sufficiently promote both collaboration and coordinated delivery of services. The hiring process itself, uh, that we believe there are inefficiencies in it that are clearly are hot, hampering operational effectiveness. Technology, there are two aspects of technology. One is how it is utilized and leveraged across the organization, and the other is how current the actual hardware and application systems are. So presently, the data systems and hardware, there's no question they require updating and investment, as well as aspects such as Wi-Fi and other application and software systems that are used to deliver programs and services. There's also uh, presently not a current strategic and operating plan that is being used not only to guide agency operations, but to ensure there's a proper accountability framework for the organizations. So coming out of this, we arrived at three distinct major areas of focus on a go-forward basis, as well as 18 key recommendations and many sub-recommendations. The first is a series of recommendations that are focused on improving visibility into departmental processes to break down silos, look at ways in which we are sharing information, understanding the workflow, so that anyone, any organizational unit, any operating area would have that visibility. And so we, we have a, a group of recommendations relating to interdepartmental processes, creating the tools to help facilitate and strengthen that visibility, and most importantly, formalizing accountability. The next area is fostering a culture of enhanced customer service, employee engagement, and accountability. This holds true for all organizations, but particularly true in an organization such as a housing authority, where it really does take a village to be able to deliver services to clients, to residents, to the community, and to ensure we're doing that in a seamless, responsive, accountable fashion, and that we are able to provide that information within the organization to the public and to the board. So we've identified a series of key action uh, recommendations relating to customer service, benchmarks, and the framework around which we are delivering services, enhancing both organizational and individual accountability. And what we mean there is with the respective organizational units and the individuals that comprise those areas. And ensuring that we're expanding workforce competencies with not just targeted training, but also so that we have cross-training. So we all know what the authority does and what the various business units are, are responsible and charged with so that we can all pitch in and help together. And third, focusing efforts on organization-wise, we call it knowledge management initiatives. How do we build capacity? How do we ensure alignment of just not only policies, procedures, practices, but departmental documentation, creating tools and information sharing. So we're really addressing the visibility issue and that everyone has access to the important information and creating a culture where we're really focusing on lifelong learning and various aspects to improve all of our capabilities as an organization and as individuals. For next steps, we've identified four key next steps. One is, as the final report is delivered, to review and accept the or recommendations and key action items that are contained therein, and then to actually focus on creating and building a strategic and attendant, what I call, top tactical plan. We have a mission and vision. We then will have goals, but we want to make sure 
that we have that backup in terms of how we're going to implement them down to a tactical level. And whether that's on the development side, whether it's internal or external facing, it is something that the organization will be able to leverage both to ensure internal accountability and to report out on accomplishments as well as challenges. It will also serve, I think, um, to be able to highlight from a revenue sourcing perspective in making the case and being able to deliver on the promises that, that are made. So assigning accountability and timeframes for the action items that will be that are included both in the report, but I think ultimately in the strategic and tactical plan, and having a monitoring and reporting framework that will allow the organization to have a dashboard as well as the board and and current visibility, red, green, yellow, as to where the authority is on a host of initiatives. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Well, yes. Commissioner Craig? Commissioner. I just want to say thank you so much. It sounds so good. Goodness, it almost makes me want to work for the Housing Authority with all this good stuff that's coming in. I'm sorry. I, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, it almost makes me, with all, I'm not saying I have a fault with the Housing Authority, but it makes me want to, oh, my goodness, all these good things she says that she wants the organization should be able to do. Now, my question is, so you talked about monitoring and accountability and all of that. So you're presenting what you have learned over time. Correct. So when you go back, would you present with them examples, uh, finite examples, and maybe infinite examples where they can achieve all of that? Yes. So in our recommendations, we are very specific okay. into the action steps that we would recommend the authority consider for implementation. We also, uh, as part of the separate, in the report, there are a, a variety of different analyses of different aspects of operations at the authority that also have some specific, both recommendations and what I would say, insights to, for you to consider. So whether that's on, for example, scores that maybe have been trending down a little bit, what are the things that, what are the initiatives that the authority can undertake to ensure that you continue to be a high performing organization, um, both from a HUD perspective and in general, from a, just a, a good, well managed business, uh, albeit a public sector entity. Uh, and we've worked with housing authorities across the country. And I would say right now, many of them, particularly because at this time, with the, when you think about the rescue plan and the other um, federal programs that are currently out there, how you can both inter and intra-governmentally really focus on some of these areas to even better leverage available resources. And so we want to make sure that we've got the organization that's ready to receive and implement. One more. How sure. How successful? How successful, and give me some numbers, like maybe you've maybe gone to a place that was maybe 50%, and then because of your implementation, you can see it's been an overall growth of maybe 75%. So what I think is most interesting is how you set up the, the way in which you want to manage the accountability. So if you, if our, if, I would say that as you formalize and adopt recommendations, putting in place a plan that is really an actionable strategic plan. So I always say it's really two plans. It's where do we want to go, what are our goals and objectives, but then what are the specific tasks that we need to undertake, and more importantly, who's responsible? And how do we ensure that we are managing and monitoring the, the various um, steps and the various action steps that would be contained in each of these, uh, I would say, in each of the work areas? And that really, how we put in place that dashboard and what the ongoing process is. A plan is only really worthwhile if it is acted upon. And so it's important really to embed it in the culture and the values and the way in which the entire organization and workforce believe and are invested in it to ensure success. So what I would say is those that are the most successful are those that take it seriously. And not just as a, one, a, once, a, a once a year or once every three year exercise, but really use it as a plan to guide operations. Um, I can tell you that one project in particular for the city of LA, the LA Housing Authority, 
they actually not only engaged in the strategic planning process, but they would tell you today they used it for five years because they kept updating it and institutionalizing it. And I just wanted to add to that, Commissioner. I, I would, would expect us to build a strategic plan and a model that's sustainable beyond who the board is and who the executive director is. You know, a, a process that says that as an affordable housing provider, you know, in the southern region, this is who we are, this is how we operate, that's built by the, 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 the current administration, including the board, but that's well sustainable beyond who's leading. Okay. Any further questions for Ms. Rahner? Seeing none. Right. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate much. all of this information. I know the board is very um, supportive of making sure that we're taking and vetting what we have and then figuring out a path forward to continue to improve because we know our clients deserve the best of us. So thank yeah. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I'd now like to bring up Ray Parks. Ray works um, with the consulting company that's help, helping to guide us through the, um, the CNI. And so um, we've asked her to come in and I wanted to also invite you all this afternoon, if you have an opportunity, to stop by the Andre Agassi Boys and Girls Club to um, look at where we are in the process. And Ray will speak to where we are in the design process. But I just thought it would be a good idea as she and her team came into town to update the full board on our progress. And Thank what you. time is that meeting happening? That'll be at uh, 5.15 this afternoon. 5.30. 530. 530. At the Andre Agassi on Washington and MLK? Yes. Okay. So you'll get the short version now, but mm -hmm. just in case you wanted to come out and just see it live, um, Rail speak to that. We appreciate it. Thank you. So first of all, I would say we would love for you to come out, right? So tonight we're actually um, sort of mirroring back to the community um, what we've heard and how it gets translated in the plan. So you know, we've been here for a week, and we've been collecting input from very young children, young adults, everybody else who lives here. The elected stop by, uh, uh, some elected officials stop by at one point. We've had service providers stop by at another point. Um, and so this is the um, very collaborative planning process. But what I wanted to do today is to catch you up from August, because you remember in July, we had a briefing to update where we were at that time. So since August, we have had a series of additional conversations with residents and neighborhood stakeholders. We had 40 folks attended one of our last meetings. We had 25 residents who came out. We had eight eight young people participate in a youth activity to tell us what they want to see for their future. Um, and then we got a lot of feedback from them and it's not moving on this screen. Okay, here we go. So part of what we were trying to get at is for those who live here now or those who are working here or those who are providing services, what is your vision for the future, right? And so that got translated into what folks wanted to see inside of their units, right? So here, folks were beginning to tell us about some of the things they wanted to see. And so our job now is to make sure that shows up um, in the plan. The biggest issue really for residents is that they wanted to live in a place that works for them. So if you are an elderly person, and you live alone, you wanted to have a space that allows you to live here with dignity, age in place, and also um, thrive. If you were a family with children, you needed a bigger space, you needed more storage, you needed in-unit washer and dryer. If you're somebody that was physically challenged, folks were telling us, please make sure new housing works for us too, right? So these are the things that we were gathering back in August. We also asked folks to tell it what kind of housing you wanted to see. This is really a little bit of an exercise that folks started rating the vis visually 
the kind of housing they wanted to see. One of the principles that we are adhering to is where Marble Manor, everything looks the same right now. The idea is there will be a diversity of housing options going forward, so everything will not look the same. So this is one of the exercises that um, we um, perform <coughs> with kids, with adults, and um, also some of our partners participated here. These are some of the images that folks were talking about what they liked. And um, here, folks rated the kind of in-unit amenities they wanted. And then on the outside, one of the things we talked about that is not <coughs> enough just to focus on having a beautiful unit or a beautiful building. How should um, the neighborhood look and feel? And so we talked about shared amenities. And these are some of the ideas that have emerged um, at the top of the list here in terms of, we have a lot of kids who live here, right? So a lot of um, activity space that works for them, but we also need multi-generational spaces as well. Lots of votes we got for community garden, and in fact, that's one of the early action activities that will be going out the gate um, fast. There was also a visioning exercise that both residents and the broader public, those who live in the historic west side, participated in. And so there is the emerging vision that is building on the 100 plan. Because remember, the 100 plan predates us. And what we're doing is trying to make sure this plan for Marble Manor itself connects up with, enhances, and then supports um, the 100 plan as well. So among the exercises, folks write their own vision for the future. You could draw your vision for the future. You could piggyback on somebody else's vision for the future. And so um, the, 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 the respect and the preservation of the history of the neighborhood was one of the themes that came out. We also heard the need for making sure we address the vacant and underutilized properties in the neighborhood so that a new Marble Manor is not sitting right next to a lot of empty spaces that are unprogrammed. Safety was another theme that came out as folks were um, visioning for their future um, as well. This is a ranking of what residents and neighborhood stakeholders have told us was important for them in terms of the amenity packet. Top, top, top of the list was street lighting. And this speaks to community safety because especially those with children will tell us they're not comfortable having their kids go out because they don't feel safe. But then we talk about what, would, what are some of the things we could do, folks, just improving lighting in the neighborhood um, was one of them. Grocery store and access to fresh food was the next um, one that emerged out of this process. The community garden was part of the conversation about access to fresh food as well, especially fresh food and vegetable, and the conversation about we could grow our own, and so the community garden has emerged as one of the, the options here. Employment training, also another big priority here, access to childcare, particularly for those who are working or want to work, S access to quality early childhood education as well as childcare emerged as one of the major themes here. Water features, it's hot here. And um, especially for those who have kids, we were, we were told loud and clear that we need to design in um, water features, gym and fitness center, the replacement of the community center was also another, another theme here, all right? We also focused on how do we support families who live here? So this plan is not just about the built environment, it was also about what do families need and want so that they might have better outcomes for themselves and their families. So this here is the community's vision for how we support people. Right, so the first group was around the, the, the built environment. Um, this one was about families who live here now. One of the big themes that came out was this idea of a place of peace, so that um, f f you know, families can feel more peaceful. Families were feeling stress and anxiety. Some of that, of course, was exacerbated by COVID. Some of that is because of community safety concerns. 
but this idea that we need to design spaces that will contribute to um, this sense of peace was a big theme that emerged as well. Happy and supportive residents. This is the other theme that came out. There is a very important request to make sure we're focusing on businesses as well, where we can bring back businesses to this area, support existing businesses, and then, of course, employment and training. There's a package of amenities that residents have told us that they need and want, and this is the priority list here, income and employment, health and wellness, and education and youth. And within that, there are many, many subcategories. So fast forward to this week. So this week, we had a series of design um, sessions that included Monday, we focused on working with the ambassador group. These are a group of residents that have been hired and paid, and they are embedded in the planning team, and they're also sort of spokespersons for the project. So they're both providing input as well as pro collecting um, um, input from the community as well. So Monday was focused on them and um, the vision that they want to see about how we build out the space. On Tuesday, we had residents, there was a studio just for residents who wanted to participate, and then there was a separate studio just for neighborhood uh, stakeholders. Yesterday, we worked with our young people, and then today, we will be unveiling the emerging um, vision here. This is where we are right now in terms of the housing plan as it is emerging. There are 235 units here right now. The commitment is there's no net loss of units. We are looking at a housing plan that's in the 600 unit range. And depending on any number of additional factors that could grow, we by right can do at least 500, but as you know, the higher you go in density, we have to solve for parking as well. We are also talking about a new mixed income community. So where we have the replacement of all of the existing public housing units today, we are adding net new affordable housing as well as unsubsidized housing. So whatever the market will support. So that's how we have arrived at the mix. So we have deeply affordable, we've got what we would refer to as workforce housing in the middle, and then we've got straight up market rate housing. This is the only project right now in the city that's delivering affordable housing. All of the other housing at, at scale, I should say. The other deals that are coming down the pike are predominantly market rate product. We're also talking about integrating community amenities. So where it is possible, we're talking about mixed use where the ground floor could be community serving retail. We have talked to service providers who have expressed the desire to expand early learning here. So we are programming early learning spaces here and are talking with um, a provider who is willing to finance that as well as operate the slots. We are also talking about spaces for community service providers and that could be the museum or the library or the AD Guy Center or any number of providers who want to come on site and provide supportive services to our families. Um, we are also talking about an outdoor package that is a combination of things. One, just open spaces and parks that work for multi-generations, right? Covered for the most part because it's very hot. And also um, water features, residents have asked for a dog park, residents have asked for um, public art, residents have asked for an amphitheater, and all of these are now showing up in the plan, all right? Normal things like pro property management office and supportive services space are also being planned here. So when you come tonight, you will see the emerging plan. These are just some of the renderings that are emerging from um, our work this week. One of the themes is we've got to provide more greening of the neighborhood, right, as a way to mitigate some of the heat impacts as well. So you'll see some of the images um, that are emerging. 8th Street is emerging as a gateway corridor for us in this plan. And so this is a view that we worked on with residents yesterday and the day before about what that could look like as a gateway um, into the community. 
Um, and then this is a rendering that emerged also with the community this week about the Abodo urban farm. You probably, if you remember, we have $100,000 that is available right now that the Housing Authority, with HUD's permission, can spend in these early action projects. And this is a project that has emerged as the number one vote getter, some improvements to the Oboda urban form. And this is a rendering of what some of those improvements could look like. Thank you. Community Garden is the second um, early action project that will receive some of that $100,000. And this is a rendering of what that community garden run by residents could look like. Tonight, you'll hear more about the housing plan as it is emerging. Um, and so I'm going to stop here and take questions. Well, very awesome work so far. I love when we listen to our community and see what their wishes and desires and what they want to see it looking like in the future is, but um, I'll see if any of our commissioners have questions at this time for you. No? Uh, Commissioner McCurdy. Um, thank you for the presentation. Looks like there's been a lot of work put in. Uh, can you speak to the mix of housing that you're looking at? Uh, maybe the ratio specifically that you're looking at, affordable to workforce to, like what does that mix look like? Uh, because one thing uh, that we, I, Mm -hmm. uh, would not like to see is a concentration of poverty, mm -hmm. right? The only way that we are going to lift up our community is by lifting up the annual household income. Right. So if you can speak to us just on, you know, the, some of the considerations that, you know, the community has had or you have brought to the community in terms of that mix. Right. Because I think that's going to play a very, there it is. Right. So that 600-ish housing program right now, there's a minimum assumption that 20% of those will be market rate, unsubsidized market rate. So that's a floor right now that we've started with. And then we also have a floor of the 235 replacement housing. So those 235 will not change. That's a hard commitment the Housing Authority and the city has made. So the play then is so 20% minimum market. And that minimum, by the way, is baked into the calculation because one of the funding sources that we will be going after to help jumpstart implementation requires at least 20% market rate, okay? So, but we potentially have room to grow. So baseline 234 replacement, baseline 20% market, and then we've got 245 that's in the middle. These are unsubsidized units. All right, so the idea here is this is what we're referring to as sort of that workforce band. So these are going to be tax credit funded. So the tax credit program will also dictate. So that's that grouping in the middle. The exact percentages are not settled yet. We're playing around with that, but we do know the bookends, the minimum bookend of at least 20% market potentially more, and then our 235 replacement, and we're, you know, massaging that. The idea also is this will be a phased redevelopment. So the mixed income approach is going to continue through each phase. The 600 is site-wide, but as we look at each phase, we are also talking about this blending of affordability in each phase as well. All right? So I hope that answers you. It does, and that's helpful. Um, in the phasing in, um, and I know we're, these are still preliminary conversations that are being had and different considerations are obviously being thrown around trying to figure out the path forward. Uh, have you identified at which phase you would do which type of housing? No, but we have some thoughts. So first things first is all phases will be integrated. So there will not be a phase that will be just affordable housing or just market rate. So that's the first thing I will say. The second thing I will say is that we will have a diversity of building types. So we have housing that is going to be townhouse style. We will have walk-up buildings, two to three stories. 
and then we have some four or five story buildings that allow us to put retail or services or community space on the ground floor. So how those get laid out, tonight you'll begin to see a potential location for some of those, but that's not all settled yet. But the thing that is immovable is that all phases will be mixed and uh, all developments will have a combination of building types. Okay, thank you. I just want to say uh, thank you. I, I, wanted, I wrote it down about the mixed housing. I was a little curious about that. I want to thank you. I, I like the presentation. Uh, do you have any examples or models somewhere that we can look at? I won't be able to go to the talk, but maybe some places where you might have implemented this and it worked. Absolutely, and we can. We'll be happy to provide, uh, you know, suggestions to um, Lewis, in, and he can follow up. But yes. I would even go a step further, Commissioner. Um, I think that within the next you know, year or so, there can be opportunity for some of the commissioners and I to go to some other places. You know, I know that oftentimes when you go to your commissioner training, you just kind of get a snapshot, but I would love for the opportunity of uh, taking you and some of your fellow commissioners to places uh, maybe not too far away to see what these communities can result in as a result of the great work that, um, that Ray and her team does. Yes. And the good news, what we're talking about here is you're not setting a new precedent in terms of mixed income, right? right. The idea for long-term sustainability is that you want to have this diversity of incomes in a community as well as the integration of services and access to amenities. So even if amenities are not being replaced on site, right, the strategy is about how to connect our families to these opportunities elsewhere. So even though I'm focusing right now just on Marble Manor, there's a bigger conversation that's also happening about community improvements, right? And this is where the partnership with the city on the 100 plan is really important on the delivery on some of those other pieces, right? And so in a future meeting, we can talk about how those all come together. And then the third big piece of this is really the helping our families connect. Because this you exist in a city, right? And so we don't want to only worry about this one site. We're worrying about the site in the context of a neighborhood revitalization strategy and how that also feeds into what's going on in the city. But a lot of examples nationwide. Um, pretty much everybody who's redeveloping their public housing communities now are looking at mixed income communities. Um, and the strategy, though, is about ensuring you can preserve what you have, right? So hence the no net loss of units, but also grow. So this is a growth strategy, too. So you go from 235, that's here now, to doubling that over time. Sounds great to me. I like it. Follow-up. Uh, Follow-up from Commissioner McCurdy. Uh, could you go to your second slide about the engagement? This was from August. From August. Mm -hmm. So since August, you've had 25 attendees at the meetings? So this, the August engagement sessions, this is, the, this is what happened at the August engagement sessions. And then um, since then, so this week, I don't know what the count is yet because we've, had, we've been here for five days. We followed up on this. And then in the interim between that, um, Lee and her team, is Lee in the room? Lee and her team with the um, outreach workers have also been gathering additional vision and ideas. In fact, there's been a recruitment of additional ambassadors and um, the voting, for example, on the early action activities have been happening in that interim. So this is really the stuff that we facilitated, but there's been a lot of additional stuff in between. Sounds good. Thank you. I don't see any further questions. And Mr. Chair, I have to bow out. I have another meeting I have to attend, and you're going to be in good hands here with Vice Chair McCurdy.
Um, the next item, uh, I'd like to have Lee Quick come up and introduce our um, community partner presentations this afternoon. Good afternoon, Lee Quick, Supportive Services Manager for the Housing Authority. Um, we have some great partners here today, one of which is Ms. Morgan Shaw, and she is with Nevada Legal Services. Uh, Nevada Legal Services provides long-term community, uh, they are a long-term community partner of ours. They assist our residents with housing issues. They work closely with our family self-sufficiency program to assist participants and address and overcome barriers to long-term self-sufficiency. And um, so again, we have Morgan Shaw. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Jordan, commissioners, for having us. We're always happy to share about what we do with the community and how we work with the housing authority. For those that are not familiar with us, Nevada Legal Services is a statewide nonprofit legal aid organization. We provide free legal help for low-income Nevadans facing civil legal problems. We don't do any criminal defense work. We leave that up to the public defenders. But for all the other stuff that kind of comes up in life, um, that's what we're here to help with. So we do have offices across the state. We have offices here in Las Vegas, Reno, Carson City, Yarrington, and Elko. And then we serve the outlying areas through uh, remote means and also regularly scheduled outreach events. Are we, are we okay? Could we just have uh, conversations taken outside, please? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we do receive funding from a variety of places. The lion's share does come from the Federal Legal Services Corporation, Nevada Bar Foundation, Nevada Attorney General's Office, Clark County, and a variety of other, other sources. And Giving Tuesday is coming up, so I'll just throw in private donations as well. <laughs> Uh, who we serve. So in order to receive services from our office, uh, individuals do need to live in Nevada and they need to qualify as low income under federal poverty standards or meet other grant-based qualifications. Uh, for some of our programs, we do have higher income restrictions, so we do always encourage people to go ahead and make the referral or call for help and let us figure out whether you qualify or not. Um, and then in most cases, clients do also need to be U.S. citizens or have other legal immigration status per our federal grant requirements. Uh, in addition to serving the general low-income population, we have targeted programs and outreach serving people living with HIV and AIDS, veterans, seniors, Native Americans, and farm workers. So what can we do, right? Uh, our team of staff attorneys, paralegals, and pro bono attorney volunteers provide a range of services that can be anything from telephonic advice all the way to representation in court. Uh, the case assignments are going to vary based on um, you know, our staff availability, the merits of the case, the type of the problem, every single case goes through an, accept, an acceptance process and we're assessing that. Um, you know, sometimes the answer is not to assign an attorney to go to court for someone. If we can see on its face that, you know, someone doesn't really have a lot of options, they don't have a defense to an eviction, for an example, we're gonna give them that advice so that they have that information and know how to move forward, but we don't have the ability to, you know, assign an attorney to represent every single person, so we have to make those determinations. Um, for those that were not able to help one-on-one, -on -one, we do have a lot of Ask a Lawyer clinics, self-help resources, and community legal education classes. Just for a few examples, we do have weekly free education classes on criminal record sealing in partnership with the Boyd School of Law. We also have regularly scheduled Ask a Lawyer clinics statewide, telephonically, and in person. Locally, we're here every week at the Hundridge Clinic, and also monthly at the Metro Family Justice Center. And we're also embedded now at the Mer Tate Elementary School, which is over on Cary and Lamb. I believe that actually is in your district, Commissioner McCurdy. Um, we just launched that program in October and we're kind of getting up and running. Um, and that's geared towards removing barriers to access to service, right? Transportation is a huge issue. Time is a huge issue. When people need help, they can't necessarily drag themselves downtown during business hours to get it. So, you know, the, the, this is an innovative new program that we're really excited about testing out. And in addition to that, uh, we are trying to be a, the best partner that we can be to other service providers in the community. Uh, we provide, we offer referral relationships with, you know, people that serve our, you know, similar demographics. 
and we provide staff training on legal services and common issues. You know, a lot, a lot of times social workers really appreciate having the information about what legal services are available and just kind of the basics about some of the common legal problems that they see so that they can help triage an issue spot and know, you know, okay, something's not right here. I need to make this referral. Uh, we also provide targeted client outreach and education. So. Uh, Ms. Quick was kind enough to mention the partnership with the FSS program. We have done a series of workshops this year with FSS. Uh, we've done uh, workshops, we've had uh, some of our senior attorneys have done workshops on credit repair, bankruptcy, and I know uh, coming up in a couple weeks we have one on record sealing, uh, both eviction sealing and criminal record sealing. And I always like to touch on why legal services matter. You know, what's, why, why is it so important to make sure that we're providing these services? Well, civil legal problems have profound impacts on a person's life and the community at large, but there's no right to counsel for civil cases. So by providing that assistance to people and helping them navigate these issues, we can prevent un unnecessary crisis moves when you know maybe a, an unscrupulous landlord is doing something that they shouldn't be. Um, we're reducing strain on basic needs resources when we're helping people access public benefits that they may have been wrongfully denied. Um, these things make a difference on a broader scale, both in a person's life and for community resources. And I'm going to very briefly run through the top practice areas just so you have kind of a, a concrete sense of what we're able to help with. <laughs> Housing and tenants' rights issues are probably 70% of the work that we do. Um, we, do uh, we only represent tenant side. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to, we know we have to kind of pick. Um, you know, I know that there are some landlords who sometimes are struggling financially, but, you know, we do exclusively represent tenants in, in, with regard to housing issues. So we do a lot of eviction defense, including mobile homes and extended stay motels. A lot of times people don't realize that extended stay motel residents do have rights, um, living conditions, etc. And we do handle uh, subsidized housing issues. So if someone is being you know, threatened with termination from their uh, housing subsidy or being, you know, evicted from a public housing or project-based Section 8, for example, they would be able to contact us for assistance and we would review it and see if they have, enough, have a defense, you know, give them the advice. So public benefits issues, denials, terminations, reductions, and overpayments of a variety of public benefit programs. We've, we've seen a lot of unemployment benefit and PUA uh, issues over the last couple of years with the pandemic especially. Um, so if anyone is you know, being told that they should not have been paid and they need to pay all the money back, or uh, you know, they are being denied at the outset or they're having a reduction, they, they want to see if that's, the, you know, they're questioning whether that's correct, they can absolutely contact us, but we do not help with the initial application process. There are a lot of other resources for that. Uh, record sealing, as I mentioned, uh, criminal records and eviction records. Some people don't realize that eviction record sealing is an option in Nevada. Uh, we're kind of special in that way. Uh, eligibility is going to is going to depend on exactly when the order was entered, but you know that's something that we would evaluate case by case. And then consumer issues. So that can be you know bankruptcy, debt collection issues. If someone's being garnished, and you know maybe they only receive SSI, uh, you know things like that, we're able to assist with as well. And then we have kind of the kitchen sink of family and end of life needs, uh, name and gender marker changes, guardianship. Uh, wills, powers of attorney, simple estate, probate, adoptions, child custody and support issues, and di divorce. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list of everything that we can help with, but I kind of wanted to just give you sort of the highlights of the things that we're most often asked to help with. Uh, if you want to learn more or ask for help, please, by all means, go on our website, nevadalegalservices.org. We have the ability to do online intakes. That's often the fastest and most efficient way for people to get into the intake queue to ask for assistance. Um, we also try to provide a lot of information for self-help and education, both on our website and on our social media and YouTube channels. Our YouTube channel has a lot of videos um, and we do lives every so often. We have almost a thousand subscribers there now. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> but um, yeah, so those are the resources that we have available and we're always happy to look at other ways that we're able to help the community and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you so much. We certainly appreciate all the work that you do. We've had some opportunities to work together in the past and truly 
appreciate you and your organization. Commissioner Zegerblum? I was going to follow up on the money we gave you for the marijuana ceiling. How's that going? <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, it is going well. Our, uh, our team is very busy, and we are going to be ramping up outreach in the new year as well. So we're always out there. I'm sure you all have seen us out at events. Um, we're always out there letting people know that we're here to help. And I know uh, the record ceiling cases are definitely coming in the door, you know, and as I mentioned, we have those weekly classes and that's a steady stream as well. Is it specifically oriented towards marijuana? It's not limited to that. The, the funding was not limited in that way. Uh, are, did, were you able to hire any lawyers or anything? We do have an attorney working on the project and we have a paralegal, one paralegal, and I think the second one is getting ready to start. Um, mm. Yeah. It was like $250,000 a year, so you ought to be able to get more than one attorney, I would hope. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, unfortunately, we're dealing with the same hiring crisis that everyone else is apparently dealing with, so it's very hard to hire uh, legal professionals as well. Um, I know the other legal aid organizations in town are experiencing the same thing. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Lee Quick, Support of Service Manager, Housing Authority. The next person is Nicole Pangelinen, and she's an outreach and admissions counselor. She's with the Sierra Nevada Job Corps, and their mission is to teach eligible young people the skills they need to become employable and independent and place them in meaningful jobs or further education. They're another great partner of ours, so Nicole. Thank you, Ms. Lee, for the introduction, and thank you, board, for your time this afternoon. Um, so my name is Nicole Pangolinen, as Ms. Lee mentioned, and I am an outreach and admissions counselor with the Sierra Nevada Job Corps program. Job Corps is a education and training program operated by the Department of Labor for youth and young adults ages 16 through 24. Um, in this program, we do assist them with completing their academics, so their high school education, provide them with hands-on career training as well. Uh, it is a self-paced program, so they are able to just kind of take their time in order to achieve the goals that they have set forth for themselves. Um, we are a residential program as well, so all of the students uh, reside there. We provide them with three free meals a day, basic medical and dental services, as well as um, placement options for up to 13, or placement services for up to 13 months. As far as placement, those can look like um, apprenticeship programs, furthering their education at college, gaining employment, or even going to the military. Um, these youth and young adults do also get paid while they are in the program. Every two weeks, they learn independent living skills throughout the program. And then, of course, those employability skills. Our goal is to help them to achieve the uh, academics that they need to as far as high school completion or um, GED, as well as give them the skills and certifications that they need in order to be able to come back to the Las Vegas community gain employment and contribute back to the economy so that's our goal with this program um, and that's pretty much all that I have do you all have any questions any questions from the board how many kids can you can you handle so uh, our job career program my office is located here in Las Vegas so we serve Las Vegas and in the surrounding areas too but the actual job core center is in Reno will pay for their travel and all of those things that are associated with it and our campus can hold over 300 or no actually 500 500 youth at the center um, but the center does comprise of both residential students as well as non-residential students unfortunately for our Las Vegas and surrounding area students who do apply for their program they wouldn't qualify for non-res because they can't travel back and forth to Reno every day of course so they would have to be um, residents there but it is a free program it's free education free hands-on career training free certification 
Um, and as I mentioned, that they also get the little benefit of being paid while they're throughout there. So, and we have, we actually have over a hundred job course centers across the nation. We always like to um, go based off of their interest, of course, with the youth and young adults, we want to make sure that they are doing something they're interested in. It'll make it easier for them to be successful in the program, and we want them to be happy when they go to work as well. Um, so if, let's say, they're interested in a career training area that may not be offered at the Job Corps Center in Reno, then what we can do is we can look at the other Job Corps Centers within the U.S. and then find what's going to work for them. Thank you. I have a question. Follow up? Yes. Uh, what kind of uh, skills do you offer? What kind of, say that again? Job development skills do you offer? So we provide them with all of the training that they need for that particular trade. We have so many different <laughs> career trainings that we offer. And then we also have a career services team who works with them. We have counselors on center as well to help them to prepare for the workforce, not just to get a job, but to keep a job. So um, there, our career transition team is constantly working with them, resumes, doing mock interviews, things of that nature to um, just help to prepare them for what's to come. Okay, for an example, the job corps that I used to know, they prepared for carpentry. Some of them were pre prepared to be CNAs. Oh, Some yes, of all of those. So all of those are available? Yes, all of those are available. And I did distribute a flyer as well. Um, and we have quite a bit of trades in a lot of the industries, of course, that are in high demand. So advanced manufacturing, renewable resources and energy, um, of course, health care, um, man, construction, finance and business. Yes, so it's, it's, it goes. It's and just a, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the flyer right here, it has like a list of some of the I ones. had been acquainted with Job Corps years ago, mm -hmm. quite a bit. So you all have grown quite a bit because oh. you were, they were very limited back then, particularly for the males. How are the, the female jobs? I mean, I mean. Just. So how are the female, I'm sorry, say that again? I'm old enough to remember the biases. Oh, yes. So what I'm saying now, so the females are able now to jump into construction with no problem, with no difficulty, electricians. And oh, yes. And we actually encourage that for the females to go into those non-traditional trades because just because you're a female doesn't mean that you still can't do that work as well. Of course. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Very good. Um, this is Vice Chair. In addition to saying uh, happy Thanksgiving to all, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the continued work that uh, comes out of uh, um, Commissioner Diaz's office in her um, traditional third ward Thanksgiving lunch that will be held tomorrow um, from uh, noon until two. And I also wanted to thank you for the work that you're doing out of your district in your annual turkey giveaway. and. Uh, just wish everyone a happy and festive Thanksgiving, and that concludes my report. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Executive Director. We will now move on to the second uh, portion of public comment. These are, this is your time to provide remarks on items that were not on the agenda. Um, your comments will be limited to three minutes. Please uh, start by introducing us to you. Phyllis Carpenter, 5200 Alpine. First off, I want to start out with last month, you guys said that you're just his boss. I camped out for five hours the other day in his office because I have been on the phone with his executive secretary, who was Ava's secretary before that, and she refuses to make an appointment with him for me. How is he supposed to know how his employees are treating me unless he has a sit down with me? Um, you said you wanted to raise the um, the income for the people at Marble Manor. I'm an SFS participant. I am a Section 3 worker. I went to work at your, your sister property as a maintenance worker, and I only got $11 an hour. So how did that raise my income? It did nothing except for knock my self-esteem down. Um, they, did you see how they bird-dogged me? When I came in, security went over to that corner. He nodded to security. Miss Diaz, when she went to walk out, I followed her out. Miss Quick, security, they all bird-dogged me. It was right on my back when I was trying to talk to her. I left, I emailed half of you this week because your emails are not on 
the Sonora website. How are we supposed to get a hold of you if there's no information to even contact you? Um, he refuses to meet with me. He, um, okay, so they're doing mold remediations in Sartini right now. When, when we met with the, um, they came and they did a presentation. I know when they did my mold remediation in my apartment that they are not certified. Okay, they're asbestos certified. They want to say that one supersedes the other. It doesn't. If you're mold certified, you're mold certified. Asbestos it doesn't supersede it. Um, they are having the contractor come in that is not certified to do the work, and they told me, oh, well, the state of Nevada and the EPA doesn't require it, but the feds do. This is a federally funded senior complex. It has to be done in a particular manner. Ms. Quick and her team, um, in our bylaws, it says that if there's a conflict of interest, that it needs to go to a third party arbitrator. The day after my sister died, the 15th of September, I requested to go to an arbitrator. I have yet to get a response back. They had an election yesterday for my position that is still good until September, or excuse me, until March of next year, but yet they said that they disband the board. They don't have the right to disband the board. It's not a management board, it's a resident council board. And it says that they wasn't allowed to create a competing organization to compete with ours. Well, what do you think Sonara.org is? I mean, I don't know what else to say. I get up here, you guys wanna label me as a complainer, but every time I've gotten up here, there's been, they've had to come and fix whatever it was I was complaining about in my apartment. I don't know what else to say other than you want to act like you're helping people? Mr. Jordan, look at me when I'm talking to you. Please Just address your comments to the board. Thank you. Thank you. I'm fed up. Thank I don't, you. my depression, the, if you think that they haven't added to my depression, I'm over the top. I'm ready to lose it. Take a what moment. am I supposed to do? Take a moment to finish your thoughts. Take 30 seconds to finish your thoughts, and we will follow up with you. When? I don't know what else to say. I'm in tears because you guys don't help me. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in public comment? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nakia Woodson, and I have similar sentiments to the young lady that just spoke. Um, I'm here today to discuss basically uh, my perspective as a landlord and a property manager the things that go on this department is just utterly ridiculous it, 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 here's my thing hopefully i can get done in three minutes i have been reporting fraud about my tenant since july have not received any help there were four inspections prior to the tenant moving in we were cleared since that time there have been four additional inspections due to intentional damage by the tenant you guys indicate on your notices that if it's intentional tenant damage that the tenant will be billed or responsible. That's not the case. You force the landlord to fix the problem or they're put under abatement. The property has been expected September 27th, October 12th, October 20th, October 26th. We were given a clear October 20. Then suddenly we get a letter dated October 3rd that says we're in abatement again. Apparently the issue now is that the master bedroom does not have carpet and it needs sealant. I have asked Mr. Iglesias for the rules and regulations I've been ignored. So at this point, how do I fix the floor? Another problem, you guys sit out and mail letters and then you hold them. How do you write me a letter on October 20th and it's postmarked November the 7th? Then you write me another letter, excuse me, November 3rd, it's postmarked the 7th, but then you give me a follow-up inspection November 14th. I didn't receive that letter until Tuesday. I've been calling everybody, emailing everybody. It's sad that everybody that I need to address is in this room. I have called Mr. Jordan's office for a month. Uh, Mr. McCurdy, I contacted your office on the 25th. I came into this office October 12th. I asked for a copy of the entire file. What are the rules and regulations? Today is November 17th. I still don't have it. Okay, so my current issues now, um, just to try to sum it up very quickly in 57 seconds, they have told me that I have an extension until November the 28th. That's not sufficient. You all need to understand that you operate on a four-day work week, Monday through Thursday. 
So we lose Friday, we lose the weekend. So as I stand here, I still don't know what the regulation is. When you guys close today, now I have to wait till Monday to get in touch with someone. We clearly know that next Thursday and Friday is Thanksgiving. So essentially, I'm getting three days to fix floors that I know nothing about. Um, again, requested copies of the file, don't have it. Um, at this point, the tenant has not paid his security deposit. He's committing fraud. He has unauthorized tenants that are there. I have literally emailed fraud sadly probably a hundred pictures i'm being ignored at this point his tenants are threatening us the police have been called out and it's been uh, escalated to the district attorney your department is doing absolutely nothing so my suggestion if i could sum it up please in just 15 seconds yeah, take a moment to finish your thoughts thank you timeline should start at the postmark date not the date of the letter. If you're going to hold the letter for 17 days, I can't do anything. Secondly, abatement should be emailed, mailed, regular, and certified. What if it's lost in the mail? Like the notice yesterday, got it the 15th. I was supposed to do something on the 14th. So I will state my number on the record. Oh, I did talk to Mr. Jordan Tuesday. He told me Miss Alicia Jones will be calling me. No phone call. So at this point, no, I cannot get the floors done by the 28th without some type of direction from your office. So my number is 702-318-1244, 702-318-1244, and I hope someone can call me, if not today, on Monday, because I do need a further extension. Thank you. Thank you. If you just hang tight. Uh, someone will be speaking with you. All right, is there anyone wishing to speak in uh, public comment at this time? Uh, hearing and seeing no one else, this meeting is adjourned.